Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I know there's a lot of um, other things going on in Jasper and, and places to be, so I'm glad you chose to be here with us at Lake and Wildlife. My name is Dara Sinclair. I'm a co-chair along with Brian Vassar here on the second row. Okay, and we have our board report for Michael. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Usually, I do a very short board report, and uh, <laughs> that's not today. I, I, I promise to be out of here by two, so we'll be fine. I, I'll be done for that. <clears throat> you know, the number one question people ask me, how do you like serving on the board? And I tell them I love it. It's outstanding. I enjoy that part of, in, in business world, that's what I enjoy, the inner workings of a business. And that's what this is. <clears throat> so today I'm going to go through the uh, board report um, because that's my job. I was told by Glenn that that's your job, report what's going on at the board. Um, so we have our normal agenda, and um, I should mention at this point, please feel free to attend the meetings. Um, they're very lightly attended, and we would love to have more attendance. <clears throat> but we go through our normal agenda, committee reports, the president report, general manager report, and then we have new business. Uh, this month was on September 26th, and a couple of things that applied to Lake and Wildlife. We, uh, we passed the initiative to ban fishing on the spillway. That was a very important thing for Lake and Wildlife people. We also amended some rules and regulations regarding boat storage and... Uh, boat policy for decals, the, the marina had gotten kind of out of control, people just doing what they wanted down there and that's been corrected and along with that <clears throat> we assigned fines for those policies that were uh, violated. We also went through um, the LAD committee, uh, uh, some combination of like uh, some land lots being combined. We had a um, BTAC Activities Committee officers uh, for the coming year uh, yeah, approved. Then we had a couple of budget amendments. Um, it's where we go through and if there's anything that needs to be changed to the budget dollar-wise, they're brought up. Uh, we passed a um, expenditure of uh, $11,000 to replace a gas pump that you know, provides the fuel for our equipment. People go, well, that's a lot of money. It was bought in the 80s, and it was a 1960s model. <laughs> Enough said. <clears throat> so we had to do that. There was also uh, the upper pool pump went out during the height of pool season, so we replaced that. We had a, um, uh, a need in the uh, technology area where we uh, passed uh, $4,000 to update our technology. There was a, a request made to paint the courts building that has not been painted since I believe it was built. And uh, we tabled that until budget time, which is coming up, and we will discuss that then. <clears throat> Long before I was here, there was a fellow named uh, Tim Carver that has spent his basically his adult work life here building and shaping Bent Tree. And he retired, and we agreed to uh, lease him his property which is down at the campground so it just shows that there's uh, there's there's people in this community that want to take care of the people that have spent their life building this place for us and I was very proud to be part of that committee that approved that so that's the uh, board report now I have a couple of things that I want to mention that are important the CCF the capital contribution fee there's been a ton of work done by a number of people headed by board member Ralph Morse to get this instituted and passed. Uh, hopefully everyone is familiar with it. It is posted on every Friday email. It has come out. We've had town hall meetings. I don't want to go through all the details. We need everybody to vote on that. Yes or no, doesn't matter. We need to reach a quorum of 540 votes. That Nothing will take place unless we reach that number. So please, if you haven't voted, 
I'll answer in one second. If you haven't voted, please vote. Please talk to your friends and neighbors. Make sure they vote. It is due by the end of October. We set a, a arbitrary October 15th deadline to get a count from this uh, Votegrity so that we had two weeks if we needed to get on a telephone blitz to make sure we reached a quorum. So I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to vote. Um, you know, the nice thing about being the board liaison here is this is the most vibrant and active committee we have in Bentry. And I am, just can't tell you how pleased I am to be the liaison because these are informed, active people in our community. And that's, that goes a long way because I'm getting ready to tie into what I'm leading to, which is the budget process is coming up this month. The board will be meeting for the next three Tuesdays to hammer out the 2024 budget. And we would like input, be it after the meeting today, there's a number of board members here, emails. This is our community. Not as a board member, I'm one of the community. It's important to me. I have property here. I want to maintain the value of my property. And it's important that we have feedback from everybody on what their importance is. So please don't be shy about making your feelings known. Somebody told me recently, and it was rather recent, and it pertains to the budget. Golfers pray for sunshine. Farmers pray for rain. God can't please everybody. <laughs> I thought, you know what, that, that's pretty appropriate. As we talk about the budget, because everybody has different priorities, and we have a, a limited revenue stream. And while I would love to uh, float the idea that we pass a $5,000 assessment on everybody, that's not going to go over very well. Um, <laughs> But we are tied by our, our uh, CCNRs and bylaws of what we can do, and it's tied to the CPI in Atlanta in June. One second, Rick, I'll get to you. Just because you had a hole in one to this week <laughs> does not give you priority over Bill. That was a joke. Uh, okay, that was a joke. Okay. It would probably be my last act on the board, I would imagine. It was a joke. That's where things like the CCF come in, revenue streams. We can only do so much with the revenue that we have. That's why the CCF is so important. Um, the negotiation of the cell towers by Jim Pryor was very important to generate revenue. Um, interest rates at banks, that we were, had money in banks that was not getting the, the maximum interest rate that we could get. These are things that the board is looking at every member of that board is like myself, watching every nickel and dime. That is our fiduciary responsibility, and I take it pretty serious, and so does everybody else on the board. Um, you know, there's potentials with Sharp Top. Selling Sharp Top, we were disappointed in the appraisal that came in, so we're going back to work on that. Uh, campground, possible sale of the campground. It was, personally, it was disappointing on the number of responses that came back. We have no interest in selling the campground. Okay, so you're limited by what we can take in as to what we can spend. And that's, that's my point there. We've got uh, expenses that are, I don't think anybody needs for me to remind you what it costs to go to the grocery store or fill up your car these days. Um, our personnel, in like any other business, is what makes your business. And we have to take care of those people. Cost of insurance rising. Uh, just the cost of inflation is taking a toll on our paychecks. Those of you who still have a paycheck, I, I'm living off the government right now. But um, We have great opportunities here. We have a what I consider a outstanding general manager in Jim Pryor at the right time. He has brought a lot of organizational skills and is helping us move forward with planning and execution of those plans, and that is critical. And he recognizes, you know, he comes from, uh, from Forsyth County, 
government operation where they have a lot of unlimited funds. We don't have that. So we work with what we have. And he's, his preaching is all about accountability. And that's, that's important. We'll start our budget process on Tuesday where he has all of his directors who will come in and make presentations on what their department can and can't do. Uh, we got together and passed an agenda where we want to see his departments come in with no increases. Probably not doable, but that's what we tasked him to do. We need to get a control over every dollar that we take in. And we feel like we're headed in that right direction. We have a lot of needs, not wants, a lot of needs in this community. We're very proud that we don't have any outstanding bank loans. But our debt is our infrastructure. And we've got to maintain that if you want to maintain the lifestyle we have here. That's just a simple matter of fact. There's not a lot of ifs, ands, or buts. <clears throat> Last year it was not very popular, but a couple of us talked about, you know, we may need to look at taking on debt in the future. That's not very well accepted in a community that that's what we pride ourselves on, but obviously now is not the time to talk about loans at interest rates at these record levels. So again, you only have revenue and expenses, and you've got to get those in line, and that's what we're working on. So to sum it up, please have your voice heard, whether it's at the end of this meeting, whether it's email, phone calls, the board is very open to hearing what anyone has to say. And we very much appreciate the survey responses we got. We got almost a 50% return from our community on the, the staggering numbers you get are 15 to 18% return on surveys. We had almost 50%. That's what you need. You need community involvement. This is one of the finest committees we have as far as involvement. Um, we took those surveys and Glenn set up an ad hoc committee to take that survey and step it forward one more step into the planning of what these, these surveys showed us. So this is an active board. We're moving forward and we appreciate everybody's input. Thanks very much. Oh, I'm sorry, we had a couple of questions. I don't want to take away from this. I'll be running out of here. I think Bill asked, had his hand first. What's the participation ban on the CCF proposal? That is an excellent question that I sent in this morning and we do not have an up-to-date number. It was online voting, right? It's online voting. The company has failed to respond to Ralph's request for that yesterday. So I'll, I'll add to that. So as of last week, uh, I did have a number. Uh, all I want to tell you right now is it wasn't in a forum. So Michael is stressing why it's so important for everybody to vote. Um, we have to get a forum. So we're not there yet. The online voting, Michael, it's okay to say, sure. it takes 30 seconds. <laughs> if those of you that have done it, it's 30 seconds. If, if you want help, Call me. I'm in the directory. Email me. I'll help you over the phone. I've done that with about six people. Michael will help you. Buddy will help you. There's people to help you that will do the online voting. All you need is your PIN number that's on the ballot that you receive. You don't have your PIN number. You can also mail it in. You can mail it in as well. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't, if you can't find your ballot for whatever the reason, let us know. We can get that taken care of as well. Imperative. Let's think. Rick had the next question. Mr. Holen won. You just wanted to address my five thousand dollars was not a was not serious. Yeah, yeah like a recall is where it could go. To. Yes, Gene. What was the theory behind canceling fishing at the spillway? The spillway is used by the equestrian folks for the horses. There's also people, I don't want to say swimming there, but wading in and fishing, and hooks in that have been found in the past in the horses as well as people who are the down the dogs as well down there that swim so it was you know we've had plenty of places to fish other than the spillway so i appreciate everybody's attendance and thank you okay thank you michael so um Jumping in, this is uh, an opportunity for our subcommittees to talk about uh, opportunities that we have in the coming up in the near future. So I think Kathy, you had something to say about fundraising, maybe. Okay. 
Um, we have to, I'm with Tamarack Treasures. And uh, for those of you that don't know, we have three more days of collections, and that's on Monday. And it's at the admin building. You drive in, drive around. There'll be some lovely people there with tables, and they'll take your discarded goods. Another thing to remember is if you're looking for something, for those of you that got presents last year for your birthday, for Christmas, from your in-laws, your outlaws, your children, <laughs> your grandchildren, and at the time of the party it was the best thing you ever had and you'll use it all the time. After all said and done it goes back in the box and it goes back in the closet because you don't have the heart to discard it. Well now's the time. So bring it to us. We'll treat it with love and we'll discard it for you. <laughs> Someone else will buy it. <coughs> we have, uh, like I say, collections are 1030 to 1130. If you have a problem with those times, then let us know. You can either text Marietta, you can call her, she'll call me. If uh, they have to come to my house, then, you know, that's fine. We can do that, and we'll get them where they have to be. The garage sale is going to be November the 11th, starting at 9 o'clock. So, hope to see all of you there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be for one day. So, the sooner you get there, the doors open, the quicker we can sell everything, and the happier we'll all be. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I'd like to mention that's a fundraiser is we're doing the poinsettia sale. And we have order forms over there at the table, and I'll leave some up at the mail center. Uh, in the Echo, it talks about the pickup date is December 2nd from, I think it says, what, 10 to 12, but it is actually pickup day, it's going to be the second, but it's going to be from 9 to 11, so you all are going to have to get up a little bit earlier to come and get your things, and that's about it, that's it. right? Great. Thanks, okay. Gabby. Thanks. Thank you. Mason, we have work day today, right? You want to say anything about that? It's Sally Doss. Yes, we're getting close to being done with the cleanup down at Sally Doss, and hopefully we can get a lot of folks to come down and finish it off today. Uh, we got several loads of mulch that we want to spread on, particularly one trail on the hillside to control erosion. Uh, we've got some wood brush that's already been cut up and just needs to be dragged. Uh, we're going to create a few habitats down near the lake area, and we've got uh, some fairly small logs that need to be laid out to line the trail. <coughs> so hopefully we can finish it off today, and hope we got all the hangers out of the trees that are near the trail. So the place is pretty safe right now, and there was quite a bit of, quite a bit of storm damage if anybody got down there and saw it before before the cleanup. It was made. You could not. You could be standing on the trail and not know where it was. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. mm. yeah. And we are having lunch, so we're going to see how that impacts um, <laughs> attendance at the cleanup. Um, so sandwiches from Ingles um, and chips and tea. Um, so that'll be so we can we'll feed you. Um, from 11.30 to 2, so right um, after this meeting, and you can come for the first part, the second part, the whole part, an hour, and leave whatever you, time you have to contribute. Um, come and get a sandwich and, and, and a little bit of love on Sally Doss. It's a, a highly used trail, so we like to keep it in good shape, and it did take a significant hit with the storm, so it would be nice to get it back in shape. So, uh, Yes, okay. I just need to remind everybody at Tamarack Treasures, which is November 11th, 11-11, don't forget. Um, besides the, all the good items to buy, we'll also have the bake sale going again. 
So you want to make sure that if you're going to help be a baker, plan ahead what you want to bring. You'll bring it in the day before. Um, that, like we have done in the past, we'll set up in the lobby here and on the 10th floor have where you can drop off. Or if you can't, contact one of us and, and let us know when you do a pickup or something too. But um, we need, we're going to need bakers again for 11-11. So, and then buyers, bakers and buyers. <laughs> People that make it and the people that eat it. Jan? Um, as far as hiking shows, we had a successful trip to Greenville, got back yesterday. Our next event is on November 1st. We're going to do two trails locally. One is in Talking Rock. It's the Talking Rock, Rock Preserve Trail. And then we're going to go to Ball Ground and do Roberts Lake Trailhead. So that's November 1st. Okay. And if you don't get um, updates from the hiking club, let Jan know. There's an email. Um, still active, right? Yeah, and so you can get subscribed to get um, reminders and all the details of the hikes that the hiking club is doing. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily go on all of them, but then you'll get more information. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to spend, um, I'm going to talk and then Barbara Collier is going to um, also be part of this presentation in sharing what we're doing with habitat conservation. Um, here in Bent Tree. So um, Habitat Conservation is a subcommittee of Lake and Wildlife. It used to be called, <clears throat> excuse me, Forest Conservation. Um, it had been a, a subcommittee for a while and we, we renamed it in an acknowledgement that we want to really um, look at and uh, improve all of the habitat areas, not necessarily just the forest, the edges of the forest, the sides of our roads, um, if we can help in our yards, um, on our common areas, these are all you know within scope um, for habitat conservation. Um, and we, we, our mission, you know, just is very simple: to preserve and protect the place that is home. It's because habitat means the natural place that is home, um, the environment that provides food, water, shelter, space. That's habitat, and conservation means to preserve and protect so very simple mission statement for this um, this group um, we're going to start with where we focus and um, we focus on the plants because that's where it all starts right all life on earth depends on plants all the energy that's used by organisms depends on photosynthesis this is carried out by green plants um, Water, minerals um, are used. The sunlight um, comes into the plant. It produces sugars and oxygen. I mean, this is the basis of, of life. Everything eats plants or eats something that eats plants. So this is the um, where, remember the food web, you know, from school? This is the beginning of the food web. It's all about the plants, which is why you'll hear so much emphasis today um, on the plants. So I hear, you know, what's wrong with the habitat in Bent Tree anyway? Why do we need a, why does it need conserving? Why do we have a habitat conservation group? Um, if you talk to people who had been in Bent Tree 30, 40 years ago, you know, you hear a lot about how it used to be. Um, and I don't think, I mean, some of it may be a faulty memory. I don't know, but I don't think that's all of it. Um, so the changes that we've seen in Bent Tree's habitat um, over, it's, since its beginning, we have um, more houses, more people. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But it does clear land, it disturbs the soil. When you bring in fill dirt, you get seeds from you don't know where, you know, that is a, a big part of introducing invasive species to an area is fill dirt um, that comes in when you build. When you get more use in an area, people's shoes, um, dogs, call, car tires, uh, you know, this is what spreads um, invasive plant seeds. And so you just get a general degradation of the environment when these things happen. Um, Deer browse. Now, you know, deer, is, is they were introduced, as I understand it, I wasn't here, um, but they were uh, brought in by the developers when Bent Tree was first um, 
in the sales mode because people liked seeing them so they were brought in to help sell um, the property here because folks coming in love to, to see the wildlife. Deer are a prey species. Their reproductive cycle is um, about surviving when they are prey. Um, but they don't have predators here. You know, they, um, we don't have wolves. We don't have things that would typically cause them to need their historical reproductive cycle. So their, um, their numbers have grown. They've ebbed and flowed through the years. Um, and they can stress a plant community. Um, they don't eat stiltgrass. They don't eat the invasive plants. They eat the native plants. So, you know, that's what they know. That's what they're used to. And they, they have to eat something, right? So we either ensure that they have food or we get rid of all of them. You know, I, I feel like if we, get, if we got rid of every deer in Bent Tree today, we still wouldn't have the environment um, that people remember from 40 years ago. So they are one part of the issue but they I don't think are the, they're certainly not the whole issue and I'm not sure how big of an issue they are um, we have fire suppression um, so you know this is um, there's a lot of science around uh, fire the use of con prescribed fire control burning fires are a natural part of the environment but ever since Smokey the Bear um, messaging after some big wildfires early in the century um, as, a, as a country, and I think globally, you know, we've just suppressed fires. So we've allowed leaf litter accumulation. We've just not managed the f fuel that's out in the forest. A lot of things, and we'll talk a little bit about leaves in a minute, um, don't go, grow through the decades of, of leaf litter accumulation. And it's not, we're not dealing with it, right? And fire's not, um, consuming it so fire suppression has not helped um, the the habitat and the last is um, the trees have matured so they keep growing and as they grow the canopy closes um, we have a lot of trees that have um, that are tall with relatively small canopies but there's a lot of them and they close the canopy and then guess what doesn't get below them that all-important sunlight that you need for things to grow. So when it's not a simple equation as to why don't we have a lush understory. Um, we don't, all of these things um, are part of the issue. And, that, and the, you know, the passage of time as, the, as, as it's occurred, things change, right? So um, it's, it's not an easy solution because it's a complicated problem. So just as an example of the complexity of it, and you know, this is, to me, uh, all of these conversations have to be in a context because they can be divisive and they can be, um, you know, we'll, somebody will walk out of here and say, Adara, she wants us to all burn in the wildfire because she's against taking out snags and deadfall, right? Well, there's a, there's a context to ev everything and leaves are, our leaves and, and snags and deadfall are two of the biggest things that are complicated questions. When you hear leave the leaves, right? That's a big, if, you, if you're tuned in to any sort of, um, I mean, you don't even have to be tuned in to the pollinator um, friendly stuff or native plant communities. Everybody's about leave the leaves. I, I feel like that message is to a large part targeted toward suburbia where you have people who are bagging up every leaf in their yard into, you know, the brown bags from Home Depot and putting them on the curb for pickup and there's nary a leaf left. They need to leave some leaves, for sure. <laughs> they do. But that, you don't apply that same message necessarily to our forest. Is those leaves that are being talked about are not a, two, a, a foot deep layer of wet, rotted leaves that no, no plants can grow up through, right? So there's a context for all these messages. And it, it is confusing um, to figure out what to do, even for somebody who listens to podcasts and attends webinars and reads books endlessly on this. It is complicated to figure it out. And I don't profess to have all the answers, but I just want to point out that 
you can't take one tagline like leave the leaves and then think that that's the answer you know to everything um you don't want them piled up against your house for sure um then barbara will be talking about some ways that leaves can be helpful um in the the habitat areas and snags which is a standing dead tree it is both room and board for wildlife and yes it will burn it's drier than a living tree and it could be fuel for a wildfire both things are true and so wh what do you do with that i guess i would suggest that you know a snag doesn't be the doesn't need to be the whole entire tree so um you can if you need to take a tree down it's too close to your house it's dead or dying it's possible to leave it 12 feet high just cut it down to 12 feet high and it will be useful for for wildlife in that um in that in that form and if it falls over it's not going to you know hurt your house um it's not 100 foot tall anymore but it will be a home for insects which in turns will feed the birds um and depending on where it is you know they're not necessarily going to um raccoons or other mammals won't necessarily live in it if it's real close to your house but if it's a little bit further out um it could be a home for for mammals as well woodpeckers will make um will nest in it so anyway enough about those two things so our overall philosophy in habitat conservation um what we're trying to do is put a finger on the scale right um just provide a little more balance back in what we feel is a good direction um and and doing that by identifying properties that can be better than they are in terms of habitat uh encouraging desirable vegetation and we'll talk a little bit about what desirable vegetation is and minimizing undesirable vegetation so that's one thing in terms of common properties and uh unimproved lots uh, but then also supporting interested residents when they say i i think i have space on my property that i would like to devote to habitat i'd like to support our wildlife better and i think i have an area um where if you help me figure out what to plant there and what can grow there um i i i would like for that so um we're and barbara's going to tell you more way more about that so um native plants all right so we talk a lot about native plants and i i i heard a um so what is a native plant uh, species that have evolved and occur naturally in a particular ecosystem they better support the food web um that includes of the local wildlife in that same ecosystem and they provide better erosion control and they use less resources from that environment now i heard a different besides this native invasive and all this debate or about it and and sort of this clear classification i heard a, a new categorization of plants that i think is fascinating and it was said there's three types of plants and i thought you know there's this kind of fits people too but for plants <laughs> there are contributors there are non-contributors and there are detractors and you can kind of overlay invasive and native and invasive plants on that and you have some that are not native but maybe they contribute or at least they don't detract and you have some native plants that are better contributors than than others so i kind of like this spectrum of of the plants and i think we'll be um using that more oh wait there's one thing i want y'all to hear cuz i think it's so cute i have to come over here to do it though native plants evolved with land for centuries they're connected to the birds to the bugs to the bees milkweed and native trees you could spruce up where you're at you'll be building ecosystems creating habitat so drop that oak seed sing a little land chant i'm a native new yorker i am not a transplant if you are that's fine grab some hops plant native get yourself a green roof create green havens i've been saving these seeds i've been growing heirlooms i see every generation pollinating their bloom Don't snooze on the sneeze weed. We got maple for the sap. Native plants have deep roots. Let's get them on the map. Native plants, native plants. So our steps in approaching these habitat areas um 
this is kind of how we look at it. We want to remove invasive plants. We want to get rid of the detractors and, and not all invasives. I mean, because there's some things that are classified as invasives that maybe we just leave them alone, right? Um, and, we, and we have a, a team, if you're interested in this, the, the RIP team, the remove invasive plant team or however you want to think about it, um, you know, to, to try to get some of these out of the way um, because they're pulling scales down in the wrong direction. We want to plant and seed contributing natives. So, uh, and Barbara's going to tell you um, way more about what those are. And then we want to let them grow. We, what, what's going good out there? We want to protect it. We want to rescue those things that might be, um, that need to be preserved, that are in danger. And and one of the ways we, you, you know, tr keep them in, is uh, and let them grow is to keep them from being mowed. And I'm really really happy with the. Uh, Travis Bryan, who is, um, I don't know what his title is, but he works with for, for Jim and then Ashley and then Travis. No, it, well, him and also, um, gosh, what's the roadside guy? White here, Larry Watkins. Yeah, both of them have been very um, open to talking to us about um, where to mow and minimizing mowing because it's less work for them, too, and, and letting things grow the plant so that they can seed and then enjoying the magic that happens when you take these steps so I I want to say that we haven't forgotten the forest so you'll hear Barbara talking a lot about things that um, don't have to do with the forest but we do recognize and there's a there's this um, the white oak initiative white oaks are are crop trees uh, white oak is an example Crop trees, the ones that make mast, are hugely important for our wildlife, for the bear, for the deer. Um, we need these trees, and, and they are lacking in the understory. Um, they either can't get through the leaf litter, or they are browsed, or they don't have enough sunlight to grow. And so there's a, and this is recognized not just here, but all across the East Coast. There's a, um, a looming crisis, they say, in 10 or 15 or 20 years where um, the, when the current oaks fall and die off, that we not have the um, young ones to take their place. And um, the mid-story is, is, has trees, species that are not crop species, and that it will be devastating for our wildlife. So we are looking at initiatives like this with the trees. Um, Rick desperately wants to get a chestnut tree in here with the American Chestnut Society that is trying to... Um, replant the American chestnut so maybe we'll have that opportunity um, and that would be like so special that'd be something you could tell your grandchildren about and you know maybe about the time they're back here visiting it would be a tree they could enjoy so these are very long-term type initiatives um, so what is there's an old saying I should have put it in here that um, a society is great when old old men plant trees Whose shade they will never sit in, or something like that. So I'm 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 proud that we have um, the people who who care about that downstream. So one one thing I want to point out, just because this is so easy, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara. Um, this is um, something that everybody can do, and um, we kind of stumbled over this trying to get some more sunlight into our uh, side yard so things could grow, and that's the idea of a mineral stump. And um, I didn't know it had a name at first, but it does. And it is a, it's the idea is, is taking out small trees or if you need to cut trees. And, um, you know, with the firewise thing, when that goes through, we'll have an opportunity to cut a lot of trees. So you don't need to take them all the way down and, don't, and leave, a, leave like a 12 or 18 inch um, stem. And it will sprout. Certain tree species will sprout. Uh, oaks, maples, tulip poplar, sweet gum. And even if they're not the woody brows that deer typically like, the the re-sprouting is supposed to be so young and tender and nutritious. The tree puts all of its energy into that. It just is a a, replen a, a source of continued brows for the deer. So they'll come through and they'll just eat it all, or groundhogs will eat it. I, you know, other things probably eat it too. And then it will just continue to re-sprout because that tree is trying to live. And so it creates a food source. And it's easy. All you got to do is just not take it down to the ground and leave it. And we've we've had great luck with, and it's been it's so 
um, rewarding to watch them use this source of browse and and you can do it close to your house or away from your house or you know in gosh we have so many at least in certain parts I know all parts of the community are not the same but we have such so many red maples they're like talk about a weed um, w way more red maples than we we need small ones and so we've been cutting a lot of them and if and the four inch you know, I say four inches because that's our rule about, well, you can't cut a tree without permission that's bigger than four inches, but a lot of them are, and to me, that's, you know, about what you can put your hands around. That's about four inches at, at, at this height. If you, uh, in the diameter of that. So if you, if you can't get your hands around it, I guess everybody's hands are different, then you wouldn't, um, you know, but that's roughly the size, and then you can take them down and they will resprout and provide a great um, source. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, who's going to talk to you about uh, habitat areas and habitat yards in more detail about what we've been doing. Habitat conservation. We definitely have not forgotten about the trees. Sometimes you can send me a text and you'll get a text back about a random tree. <laughs> it's just kind of where my mind is almost all the time, talking about mid canopy and plants. <laughs> Bent tree is special. Everyone who lives here has found an amazing part of the world to call home. Bear and bobcat tracks, herds of deer, and the adventures that are bird feeders. These all give us a big picture of Bent tree wildlife. <clears throat> the smaller picture, the often overlooked plants and creatures are the foundation for habitat areas and yards. Habitat areas are about supporting the nesting birds because with very few exceptions, their nestlings cannot eat berries or seeds. The habitat areas support our owls, lizards, turtles, frogs, and even our beautiful bears. They support them by supplying areas that are left unmowed where grasshoppers, beetles, ants, moths, butterflies, millipedes, grubs, and worms can reproduce for a steady food source. Habitat areas are about supporting our black bears. Black bears need plants. According to Yellowstone Bear World, black bears depend on spring flowers the most because that's when the flowers and leaves contain the highest protein content of the year. These spring plants include often unnoticed clovers, grasses, and dandelions. With our large bear population, that includes just about any plant that'll come up with early spring temperatures. When our early spring bumblebees start to appear, they have a double job, pollinate the early plants and provide a food foundation for our bent tree ecosystem. According to Mississippi Wildlife Fisheries and Parks, our spring black bears depend on spring plants for survival because it has been documented that black bears have a diet consisting of as much as 96% plant material. It takes quite a bit of plants to support a mother bear. Their digestive systems are poor at breaking down vegetation, and as a result, they must consume large amounts of food to gather the nutrients needed for survival. We are all familiar with our humble, simple dogwoods, beloved for many millennia, and inspiring storytellers' legends. Our dogwoods are just one of the amazing plants that are supposed to be here. They bloom after the hard dormancy that our mountains plant life needs to survive the sometimes extreme temperatures around us. Most of us, including me, call the beginning of our most special spring season the greening. Then we start to add. We add to the beauty by planting ornamentals. Because most of our beneficial plants are called weeds. No one wants weeds right? That was the hurdle I had to jump before I saw the simplistic beauty that is supposed to be here. I have gardened for over 25 years. I've taken many courses on soil health, what to grow and how to grow. But I had not learned of gardening with purpose. Our weeds beauty is right in front of us. When we see the tiny lizards, the baby songbirds, the cottontail rabbits and our beautiful butterflies. We have quite a bit of wildlife to support here in Bentry. 
So what is happening with habitat areas is growing. We have a spillway habitat support area. We have one by the beach under the power lines. It is coming along nicely. Four other areas in the planning stages for habitat support plants. And we've branched out to be able to help support habitat yards. With habitat yards, we are starting with seeds. Seeds improve the soil quality. It can give us an idea of what plant communities to invest further time and planning in in the future. We can have more diverse vegetation with, spree with seed planting and can get a clearer picture of how to support our wildlife on a larger scale. The larger projects that I keep track of on a national scale, wetland restorations, prairie restorations, the taking down of dam systems, all of these dedicated conservationists say that the first three to four years are the hardest. This isn't a short-term solution. They say the first three to four years are the hardest, that all we'll get are the weeds. I think that is a great start. Some of our most beautiful bent tree plants are called weeds, but when left to grow, they make ornamentals, non-natives, look out of place and plain. <coughs> Our spillway project, and soon to be other habitat areas, is gardening with purpose. Intentionally allowing the soil and the potential areas time without invasives so they can show us what they are capable of. I am constantly surprised at how many natives show up unexpectedly. And they show up beautiful, fierce, and free. On Tuesday, you won't have anything there. On Wednesday, you have a three-foot-tall, sweet, everlasting. I've said on many occasions, we got to the spillway just in time. I went through and documented every single plant there. It was almost comically 50% native versus 50% invasive. And that area goes way far down. There's a lot of waterway there. It was dead even. We tipped the scales. And as a community, we can tip the scales to protect every area of Bent Tree. One area that is healthy with native plantings protects the surrounding areas. When we have one single plant that does not fit into the plant community, it creates a hard environment for that one plant to thrive in. So quite a few of us end up with plants that only last one year or don't survive the winter. But when we have fields of six foot tall bone sets and dog fennels and golden rods, they are the ones that come back big and tall every year. This is where they're supposed to be. The soil fits, the temperature is right, and the wildlife benefit from them. The bone sets white blooms, the dog fennels sway in the summer breezes, and the goldenrods among the landscape with shining gold blooms. These all belong within larger groups. And once we get the erosion control in a good place in an area, and the soil is showing that it no longer supports invasives, that we can build on the ones we have. If sweet goldenrod is not browsed, how about planting a zigzag goldenrod? Or if you feel adventurous, a giant goldenrod. When we create fields of these, they will better survive browsing and help us build larger habitats. Some of the seeds we are starting with improve nitrogen in our soil. <clears throat> the South started its nitrogen problem with cotton growing. George Washington Carver was quoted saying that he saw farmers growing cotton all the way to the front doors. Legumes are a natural way to improve this by putting nitrogen back into over eroded soils. We have beautiful legumes that are native. Sensitive peas and partridge peas are where I'm starting when soils need a helping hand before they can support more. The sensitive peas are all around us, but low growing and hardly ever noticed. Their yellow blooms are rich for butterflies and moths, and it's also a host plant to increase needed insect populations for pollination. The false sunflower that we're starting at Sally Dawson and habitat areas needs a well-draining soil. So areas of up high mounds with erosion are good candidates for this native. It's long blooming, it can grow well in sandy or even clay soils. The rough texture makes it unappealing to deer. We'll start that at Sally Doss. Lou Dunnigan across from Sally Doss at Lou and Glenn's treehouse will be a habitat yard that will support the pollination there. She has picked two or three of different types of our habitat support seeds that will enhance the beauty from the edges of our golf course to near the lake at Sally Dawes. 
blue vervain, also known as wild hyssop. It can get five feet tall. That's as tall as me. It's one of my favorites that we're going to start. One day on a hike to the top of Oglethorpe Mountain, I saw a type of hyssop that had made a huge colony in fields of different wildflowers. It had colorful caterpillars all over it. We'll place that near areas around the lake or some of our partial waterways that lead to the lake. Its bloom tastes bitter, so it does have some browse protection. Cindy Smith, near our spillway habitat, has chosen some of our native yellows that we started there last spring. We'll, we will be adding some of the blue vervain there this fall. This supports the needed pollination for these habitat areas to grow. And I personally am propagating a different verbena that is a low ground cover, but bloomed beautifully all summer. It did not receive any browse pressure. The leaves are a bit hairy, which does not seem to be a preferred food source. Also have mints and 25 other plants, we'll get there. <laughs> there are many other families that are contributing to habitat areas. We started the early spring butterweeds, the one in the pictures, uh, on mountainside homes. Nancy Thurber and Marsha Hollinsby donate and help all of our efforts. They are long-time resi long residents that have a ton to teach. I enjoy learning from and gardening with them. The more of us that are involved, the more areas we have, the more likely it is that these plants will receive the pollination they have to have to survive. We'll be seeding purple and clasping coneflowers all over Bentry roadsides. These are high forage for every animal that we have here in Bentry. Raccoons climb on my deck to eat the blooms. The plan here is that since every living creature likes it, they can help spread the seeds. Hopefully with the end result being coneflowers as a roadside wildflower that comes up all over. We chose roundstone native seed because of the health of the seeds. Every seed is guaranteed viable, so this would grow healthy habitat plants. For the soil health, for those areas that we start coneflowers in, they have a deep taproot that helps aerate and break up compacted soil. So the soil health is improving, even if a bloom is never allowed to come or stay up. It is a two-year patient wait for this one, but it is working under your feet. Evening primrose. This is one that can be very beneficial here in Bent Tree. It loves to self-seed, and it takes up lots of area. It is also a unique habitat supporter in that it blooms at night to give extra food for our moths. Coreopsis, wild senna, and buttonbush are the last three that we've started our seed habitats with. They have the diversity of pollinator support and erosion control that almost every yard and area needs. They also have different, like, browse pressures. Buttonbush is um, kind of like a, a balloon with um, sticks so the deer don't want to eat it. Well, you never start a sentence with deer don't eat. <laughs> you just don't do that. <laughs> At peak bloom this year, I had over 25 different types of plants to support my habitat yard. I knew the diversity was a complete success when I started seeing literally dozens of different types of birds foraging all together. I would have a downy woodpecker five feet away from a morning dove. A whole family of Carolina wrens, chipping sparrows, robins, nuthatches, chickadees, so many others. They would just take flight when I spooked them. I would sit watching, and they would fly back within a few minutes of quiet. The peaceful quiet, the beauty of the simple and every day is what Gardening with Purpose provides. The grasshoppers need cover. The caterpillars need food. The hummingbirds need nectar. So a habitat yard is a bit of work, a bit of preparation. If there is erosion, we will need to create natural berms, kind of like terraces, to prevent total seed loss. We did this under the power lines by the beach and have had a wonderful success. We only used the leaves and sticks that were there. In less than an hour, we created a whole different habitat area. We were discouraged from even trying. A person living close to it had informed us as soon as we started that Nothing's going to grow here. The soil is bad. Quite a bit grew, naturally. We didn't have to plant anything. Now we can use that as a propagation area to support other habitat areas. And we're supporting habitat right there. Teresa and John Hoppy, uh, they're supporting that area by planting natives on a lot. They purchased very close to it. I look forward to helping with that. Teresa is an accomplished gardener, 
and the area is quite literally across from my yard. So it will be my morning coffee view. When the community is involved, every single one of us benefits. Whether it be a lunch golf cart ride, a picnic at our beach pavilion, or a kayak fishing trip, the beauty of the flowers will enhance everyone's Bentry daily life so that we can see these every day and see the beauty of the simple. We can use the leaves to slowly put water into areas that are dry and sandy. They can be used um, <clears throat> for what we need, like what we did at the new habitat area by the beach. The leaves will hold onto rainwater a bit longer than rainwater just running off, like a single watering. Um, they will slowly release what they hold and water the plant that you put them around for a few days, su supplying a steady source of much needed water, which helps the bugs that depend on the leaves. Leaves are a thousand times better than mulch, and that's with plants, not trails, like the mulch on the trails. <laughs> I would like to see habitat yards be connected through the resources that our Habitat Conservation Committee are gathering. When we talk among each other and divide the plants or the sprouts from early spring or summer, we will be doubling our habitat areas and adding a diversity of plants that can cross-pollinate each other. Thank you. The, the pollination, the soil, that's where, as a community, we can win. When we have the areas close to the habitat areas, when we have four yards on a, a, a street, and all of those flowers are getting the, everyone here is, the food supply is at risk uh, because of the, the lack of pollinators. The plants need the pollination too. They don't survive without it. So with Lou, with Cindy, with John and Teresa, that is the bigger picture of the habitat areas because it's community involvement and it's everyone doing a little bit. That's how we get it. <laughs> yeah. And, and y'all thought I was passionate, right? Right. It's, it's been amazing to have Barbara engaged and um, thank you. Her knowledge of gardening and soil and, you know, I worked in IT, so um, everything I've learned has been self-taught over the past four years, but uh, 25 years worth, so she's an incredible asset for us. Um, and one of the things that Barbara talked about Let me get my notes. Um, were so many plants. Y'all all got those, right? You knew what they were? Anybody? <laughs> I know, right? So there's some tools that I would like to see us engage in as a community that will help us support each other and share knowledge. And these are not tools that we have to build or develop or invest. We just have to utilize them. They are out there. There are two specific things that we're going to encourage. One is homegrown national park. And the other is um, Seek or iNaturalist and a project in that that will help us share and document for each other and communicate among the people who are interested and who care about these things. So Doug Tallamy, if anybody's um, seen the book um, Nature's Last Hope or the Nature's Best Hope, uh, it, it talks about... Um, he talks about the insect decline and how we have, as a society, looked at nature is over there and we put it in a national park and it's outside of where we live. Um, and these and our national parks are great, but they're disconnected series of spaces. And quite frankly, one of the reasons they were chosen or they were set aside as national parks is because they were not the best. They, nobody wanted to develop them. So go ahead and make it a national park, right? You didn't have people f fighting for them. Um, and he has this concept of what is called homegrown national park. And we can get on the map. So this is a tool that's online, and I've started it. Anybody can go to it just on your computer, on your phone, homegrown national park, and you register your your native plantings and they can be done in terms of square feet so you don't have to have acres you can put it in acres and there's also some some of those funny european type of measurements i don't know what they are but th they have square feet and they have acres right so if you have a container on your deck that you invest in native um, 
plantings. You can register it on Homegrown National Park. And they're trying to be able to visualize, as Barbara was talking about, the corridors and the connections between places where pollinators can, can fly and where wildlife can travel. So the, the, the red ones are Bent Tree Lake and Wildlife as an organization. Those are our habitat areas on common grounds. And, and the, the one blue one by the lake was a mistake. I need to remove that. The blue one up top is my house. And so I, um, I registered my house on Homegrown National Park. And I would love to see, and we'll make this a part of lake and wildlife meetings going forward, as we grow the registrations on here. So put your area on the Homegrown National Park and let's get Bent Tree on the map. They have special contests and bio blitzes and all these kinds of things to... Um, to really engage community and we will continue to remind and communicate about this and in terms of what you have to document this is what I put in so it's not really complicated right you get to define the area the right side of my backyard the left side of my backyard and the driveway toward the woods you know that's sort of however you describe them and date planted you know I just went back to roughly and some of it I didn't plant some of it I just let it grow and um, so and generally what's there so those are the that, that's just an example to show you it's not hard it's not complicated there's no right or wrong way to do it um, but you it, it uh, asks you to just document what you're doing and how you're supporting these types of habitats the other um, tool that we have to use is um, iNaturalist. Anybody have a um, and and seek? Anybody have a plant app on their phone? Like what's what's that? Or I don't know. Even even yeah, like um, Google Lens will s tell you what um, plants are, right? And um, you know, I'm the kind of person you don't want to go on a hike with me because 30 minutes we haven't gone. 50 feet because I'm out even when we do stream monitor and they're always like where's Sarah was she she's back there taking pictures of the plants my kid sent me this uh, meme it said and to my grandchildren I leave my collection of 957,824 plant pictures <laughs> which it's not quite that many but um, it's a lot um, but this gives you these apps um, and they're both free they're um, sort of they play together seek is the um, it, it's the simpler version. It's kind of the place to start. And it just gives you a live um, interpretation of what are you looking at, right, you, 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 through, with your cell phone. And iNaturalist has both the app and then a web version where you can document your observations. And there's a larger community. Um, I first started doing it about four years ago, and then I would find that people that I don't even know who they are and still don't know who they are, but they would come through and either confirm my um, impression or my selection of what I thought this plant was, or if I had left it as an unknown species because I had no idea what it was and couldn't tell from even the, the app, they would tell me what it was. So I thought that was infinitely helpful. And this, that, it's uh, National Geographic started these two apps and they use it for um, citizen science. So some of my, I was very proud that some of my observations have been tagged research grade. And so they, when you put it out there, it becomes available for people who are studying the, um, the uh, findings of some plant that maybe they're, they think it's in decline and it's helping them to really um, uh, evaluate how uh, common certain plants are. So it goes into that database. So I started a bent tree diversity project. So I did through Google Earth figured out how to do a KML file, which believe me, it is not um, it's not for like taxes or property sales or anything. But basically, it just draws a a a geographical boundary around bent tree, and it's pretty liberal kind of close up to Monument Road. I included Eagle's Rest in case we get some observations up there and, and around. So that any observations that are in this location can become part of this project. So we can um, share with each other. You can post observations. If you don't know what it is, others in the project can help you identify what it is. And I'm committed to doing that. Um, 
see the little this up in the top 234 observations and 138 species I didn't realize that apparently I'm a slow learner because I've documented repeatedly the very same plant not not just once so I've only found 138 species so many of them are multiple documented so it, because it takes a while because just because you saw it last year maybe you see it at a different stage of growth and and so it, this is a way to look back over that and keep it documented because you know we see things scroll by on Facebook but then they're gone and you I, th I think I saw this is the plant I saw last week on Facebook well good luck finding it again in the endless stream of things on on social media so this is a way you can always go back and everybody can contribute to it all you need is um, so Barbara so it's me and Barbara now, but I would love to see this population grow. And we just set it up just this week. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to communicate, to see who's interested, really, to who wants to know more um, about. And you can learn so much. It gives you links to where you can learn more about this plant and everything. Okay, so are iNaturalists and Seek two different apps? They are two different apps. And which app are you doing? I use iNaturalist on my phone. Barbara uses Seek, but her observations in Seek can be sent to the project. So I am going to be doing some um, communication more about this because I mean I know this isn't enough. If if you can go, you look into it. If you can figure it out and join up, that's great. This is an introduction to. I think these are great tools for us to um, document, and they will survive. Um, Th these tools aren't going anywhere because of their backing with National Geographic. So this will uh, be a database that people in Bentree for years will be able to um, learn from. And also then see, well, we, did we used to have a bunch of whatever and now it's gone? I don't know. Is that faulty memory again? Well, now we maybe have some, some data to back that up. How many, how, with what frequency did we see something and, and now we don't? So, um, so I would, if I was just starting with this, I would download Seek. Um, and it looks like, whoops. Was that you? Yeah. This is Seek, I think. Yep. And this is iNaturalist. So when you go to the Apple Store or Google Play, that's what they look like. That's what you're looking for. And they're both free. Can you recommend Seek over iNaturalist? Seek is easier, so it depends on where you want to start. I use I. I use I. Yes, I mean it's just a matter of like, um, Seek is more like a casual observation, but you can then upload it. iNaturalist is more um, hesitant to give you an answer. It'll say, "Well, I'm not sure. It might be this, and it might be that," and and then you have to study more. I find it more. Um, definitive and I want to know I don't want to know maybe I want to know what it is right so that's just my personality so um, I use iNaturalist and I think when I started that Seek didn't even exist I think some that Seek has is more new because people said iNaturalist is too hard so they made a simpler version is that right Barbara do I have that is that how, your understanding So you can connect it, or, or, or you cannot. With iNaturalist, it's automatically connected. It, Just so you know, like iNaturalist is a citizen science kind of network. It is. So uh -huh. Anybody does Christmas bird count? We upload all of our birds into iNaturalist. That's where it's stored. Awesome. So all across the country, Christmas bird count is where that bird goes. It's iNaturalist. 
Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I hope you join the Bent Tree Diversity Project. Most of what you'll see in there now is plants, but that's just because the only thing in there is mine and Barbara's. I would love to see this grow. Um, and and we, I almost didn't start with our, my observations. I thought I didn't want anybody to think, well, dang, I'm already, you know, it's not a contest, but I didn't want anybody to think I'm so behind already or, I, you know, I'm only going to have three. And it, so please join, you know, and, and start adding to this um, database. It will also show us who's interested. And then as a, a an interested community, we can target maybe we start a native plant society here in bent tree or we have more educational webinars or something for the people who really want it wayne yeah um th this will be a good app because it, you get confirmation back if you've got an iphone you can take a picture you can do plants or animals in the office but be careful i found a lot of the plants they get wrong so having the confirmation is good. And I also took a picture of a bear. I'm pretty sure it was a bear. He was about 10 feet away. <laughs> and it said it was a Rottweiler. So, uh, <laughs> so much for AI, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a <laughs> right, and that's why you get your neighbor uh, or, or uh, someone else confirming or, or going like, um, okay, so um, I guess I'll end, we'll, we'll end, any questions about our presentation or anything that, that Barbara said or I said today? Steve? Uh, the availability of the seeds that you've been scattering around. Um, Good question for Barbara. I will say this about seeds. We source them from Round Stone Seed Company. It is out of Kentucky, and all seeds are not created equal. We bought some clover from Tractor Supply and have been fighting Chinese bush clover ever since. Um, it is so. It is crap what they sell. Um, it's, it's, it is worth the difference in price to go to a good quality American Meadows or Roundstone Native Seed Company out of Kentucky. They are um, awesome. That's where Barbara's getting them. And we are using them in habitat areas. And I believe for anybody who um, gets involved with us, and I, we don't have an official registration process, but maybe we need one, then we will we'll, we'll share seeds. They're not cheap, and Lake and Wildlife is paying for them. Support Tamarack Treasures, but we can share seeds as well. Yes. If we're interested in doing this, I have a, an open area. I'm on Little Pine. I have an open area that's in the back, but it's pretty rocky and clay. Would something like this grow back there? I mean, it does get some sunlight, but not a whole lot. Probably more when the leaves are off the trees. Is it covered up in still grass right now? No. Okay. No. Well, then what it's I just rocky and like little rocks. What, what I my first thought is then if it's not covered up by an invasive, then whatever naturally would grow should already be growing. So it may not be a high. But but Barbara may have a different perspective. Wayne? Yeah, it, a couple of the seed companies, and I want to say one of them is American Meadows, actually has a seed mix for over your septic field. Because you don't want to, you've got to be careful of what you put over your septic field. Good point. And, uh, and, they, they, and it's specific to the southeast. Okay, yeah, they do have so seed mixes. you want mixes. to make sure that you're getting plants that are here if you get something from the northeast to northwest, mm -hmm. you may be introducing some of They have more and more um, fine-tuned seed mixes, like for the southeast, native, in the shade, deer-resistant, over your septic tank, you know, kind of uh, seed mixes. Um, they're a little bit more pricey, but if, you, if, if what you get actually grows successfully, then, right, yay for it. Sue. So, yeah, we just need help on if we want to do this, how to get seeds and what we need to do with them you know, on our property and what we need to get. So I think after we're done, we're going to collect names of people who are interested and, you know, try to spread the, the knowledge, um, the interest. 
um, and 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 get this going because there's there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. So let us know. We'll, Barbara and I will collect names, and we'll figure out how to support everybody in doing this. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we're. Um, Thank you for coming. Thanks for your attention. You guys are the best. Sally Doss, 11.30. Kenny went to get the sandwiches from Ingle, so um, if he can get through the Marble Festival traffic. I told him to go McLean and up 5.15, but who knows if he remembered. And so sooner or later, though, we'll have sandwiches um, at the Nature Center. And so we hope to see you there with gloves on, ready to work. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.